I'm delighted to introduce you to a set of panelists that I, I definitely would rather be down listening to you and actually being able to take notes. <laughs> Uh, I think we're going to learn uh, a great deal of, of uh, things and topics and perspectives around investment in sports, which is, uh, as you know, uh, a very hot topic right now in the industry. So I want to introduce uh, on the far uh, right, Tony Alcazar, the CEO of the Spanish Cell GP team. Uh, maybe he can speak a little bit more about what is Cell GP and uh, how exciting it is. Uh, Mr. Mansour al uh General Manager of Investments at the Ministry of Sports of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Sean Baz uh, from Elevate and Ben Harvard from uh, Caddy's uh, FC. Thank you for being here with us. Um, I, I want to throw a first question. Uh, since we are, let's say, an eclectic group, I'm Dominican, so I was born 11,000 kilometers away from Jeddah. Um, from the international perspective, what is uh, the, the, the most intriguing factor, or most interesting factor in, when, uh, when approaching investments in sports, right? We've seen investments in many, many areas, leagues, clubs, and, 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 and some other properties. From your special perspective and, and your, your, let's say, context as an international operator, what do you think is uh, the first thing that you will be looking at when investing in Europe or in, in Saudi, since we're here and it's also a, a great opportunity? Let's start with, with Tony. Um. Well, good morning, everyone. So I think at the end, you know, when you're looking at as an investment, it depends a lot what type of investor you are. You know, at the end, it doesn't. It depends, you know, if you're looking for something that is uh, have as a global reach. If you have a, a, a local perspective, if you are a multi-sports group, if you are a, if you are a multi um, multi-focus group like only football, like a multi-club uh, strategy, or if you are only you know a one-off investment on the on a football club or near near the sports property. So a, lo a lot of time depends on the type of investors, the type of investment strategy, the time horizon, you know, it doesn't, you know, it's not the same for a private equity that you can have a three, five year time horizon to invest or like more a family, you know, a family office or a private investor that can look into a 10 year, you know, a plan to do that. Or even, you know, uh, as we have uh, Mr. Manso here, you have another, you know, more as an investment as a, as a country. So it depends a lot of the factors when they're looking into, into an investment, you just to understand very well what type of investors uh, you know is coming to your asset or you know you as an investor you are you're looking to buy an asset so it depends a lot of factors yeah Mr. from I would say the sovereign perspective you being uh, the head of investments at, at, a, at a ministry what is the type of uh, of let's say setup in terms of looking at the investments that you that you face here in Saudi well um First of all, thank you for having us all here, and thank you for being here. Welcome to Saudi. Um, the type of investments actually comes um, or driven by a strategy from um, the Saudi Arabian government. So basically, we have developed a strategy for the sports sector um, with the clear objectives, KPIs, targets, initiatives in order to achieve those targets and KPIs. Um, Whatever we do in sport is actually linked to that strategy. So, um, and th that strategy is anchored on three main pillars, which actually the mass participation, increasing the mass participation in sport, um, the talent development, and then the elite performance. And those three are connected together. So when you have more people playing sports, you can identify the talents and then take them to the elite performance. So whatever we do in sports, sector, including investment, is related to those three. So um, sport e economy, the investment uh, attracts new fans uh, locally and globally, actually, to be part of this um, ecosystem. Um, so it's, it's all linked into that strategy. It's all very clear. They have clear targets. And we know we're heading, especially that hosting mega events such as the AFC 27 and even the, hopefully, the World Cup in 34. So we know we're heading, know where we're going. We're just uh, taking our investment toward that objectives. Yeah, absolutely. And in your case, Sean and, and, and Ben, I mean, if you tell me we're at the World Football Summit, but, but football, from the American perspective, and us that, that came from there, it's not as, as prominent as it is, but it's a great 
investment opportunity both in Europe and and yeah. uh, GCC uh, region, right? What 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 do, would you reckon in in that opportunity? Yeah, and thank you also for for having us, and grateful to be on the panel here with everyone. Um, from an investment perspective, I think there are a few interesting elements to to think through. The first is the real estate associated with it. We've noticed so many different teams and owners bundling in the real estate and viewing the stadium as an asset. So if you think about this, Fenway in Boston, for example, they're building a 1.5 million square foot complex in and around the stadium that has everything from medical research to commercial assets to restaurants, bars, and, and nightlife. And that's a big thing nowadays is how you can view your stadium as an asset and what you're buying as a, as a real estate asset. I think another big thing that uh, I believe we should always look at are the big three revenue streams, so broadcast. Um, now, of course, we're getting a lot more money from well-capitalized streaming platforms that are allowing more entrance into the market for, for better media rights valuations. Then, of course, there's commercial, so if you think of sponsorships, um, our partners at Everton, for example, they've got a sponsor uh, sleeve sponsorship with Kick, which is an online streaming gaming platform. And five years ago, you would never dream of having a, an online streaming gaming platform by a sponsorship. Uh, and then, of course, match day revenues, right? So that is the stadia in and around the stadia. Um, so I think any investment that, that checks those boxes there. Um, I also think that there is a wow factor with sports. So for a lot of people investing in multiple different industries and millionaires and billionaires that own widget companies or service companies, there's, a, there's an important piece of sports that we learned in the pandemic that sports are really like a town square, they're a community. We, we bring a lot more to the table with live entertainment than most industries can't. So I can't think of many places where um, if your team wears red, uh, and someone's wearing red in the stadium and a goal scored, you're hugging your neighbor, high-fiving your neighbor. That usually doesn't happen with your favorite TV brand or clothing brand. So I, I think from that perspective, sports and live entertainment gives these unique perspectives that, that we look for when investing. Yeah. Ben? I, I looked at hundreds of teams across Europe and uh, of course also come from an American perspective and we've seen a lot of American capital flock to to Europe particularly over the last uh, couple of years as you know the world wakes up thanks to television shows and, and and other kind of popular content that that you know this is a global sport that attracts huge amounts of talent capital and attention in a way that most American sports uh, would only dream of um, even though in many ways American leagues I think are better run and better monetized um, but I think if you go into investing in in European football you know what I tell most of our American friends is you have to go in eyes wide open and understand that there's a lot of pain associated with it. In American sports, we don't have a concept of relegation, which is hugely value destructive. Um, uh, in many of the leagues, also particularly in my league, we don't have the, the luxury that, that Sean mentioned of, of doing a real estate play where our stadiums are owned by the city. Uh, and so when you purchase a team, essentially all you're getting is that IP, that crest, and the, and the pressure that comes along with it, not necessarily um, any guarantee of revenue stream. Um, and, and, and so then as you evaluate opportunities, you have to, I think, you know, my day job is venture capital investing, and it's hard to kind of underwrite venture returns in, in sports. So you really have to love it and be willing to tolerate the pain um, of the ups and downs and potential relegations and the value destruction that come alongside of that. And of course, also, most of the teams that we, we face are also um, uh, not profitable. Um, we're, we're fortunate to run a profitable team, but it's only marginally so, and, and most are not. And so the way we look to generate revenue um, in, in really sustainable ways is through player trading, evaluating good talent, bringing it in for a low, low cost and selling it on to bigger clubs at a, at a higher price. Um, we obviously have tried to work hard on the sponsorship and social media front to build a global audience for our team. Um, but really, the, the way that you drive um, returns is, is by outperformance and making your way up the table, solidifying yourself in a league, and hopefully playing for European soccer. And that's, that's the only way you can really kind of get that guaranteed uh, significant television revenue if you perform at that level. Uh, up until that point, a lot of it is very opportunistic, not very systematic, and frustrating for me coming from more of a traditional investment background. And then finally, you kind of have to make some decisions around whether you want to be kind of investing in the principal business or the picks and shovels. And obviously, there have been more and more picks and shovels around 
expand our business, be it, um, uh, you know, kind of the social media side of things, gamification, um, uh, and, you know, expansion into new markets. Um, but, but again, from my experience over the last few years, the, the most sustainable revenue streams really just come down to performance on the field, picking good talent, selling it on, um, and not destroying value through relegation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, what we could pick from from uh, your comments is, you know, depending on the strategy or the or the setup, if it's institutional or sovereign or even private, mm. uh, you know, defining success or return on investment uh, actually boils down to understanding the value of the community that you're buying into in sports, especially in football in Europe and and the Middle East, which is a very passionate playground. But necessarily, you need to apply some certain logic, right, in terms of uh, the investments. And I, and I want to to go a little bit, you know, bird's eye view in terms of we're speaking about football, but we've seen also success stories in multi-sports uh, ventures, in, especially from the U.S. I come to mind, Cronky Sports and Entertainment. They had a massive year last year. They won everything in except the Premier League. <laughs> but. Uh, but what's your take on, on that? And, and I particularly want to start with Mr. Admokbel in understanding that f football here is by far the most important sport and actually mobilizes the country. But w how do you approach also investments from the, let's say, other sporting areas, being volleyball or motor sports, basketball or whatever? Well, um, there are two aspects. Uh, the first one, um, talking about the football clubs that we have in Saudi. Um, Ministry of Sport have introduced the club support program. That program is actually targeted to increase the governance of those clubs. And there are cert certain set of criteria. If they meet, they get some support from the government, some funding. And one of the most important criteria or element of that criteria is having multi-sport in those clubs. So if you have more than 10 sports on the club, you will get more funding. This definitely will increase um, and improve the multi-sports in every club because uh, club will focus now more than only football. They will focus on the other type of sport. This is one. The second thing, we have seen the investment of Saudi actually in different types of sports. Um, uh, last last week we had the uh, tennis ATP um, uh, new generation. We had the America's Cup. Um, uh, we have the Formula E, Formula One. So many mega events happening here in Saudi. Not only related to football, but actually related to so many um, other type of sports. So the country have identified again back to the strategy. We have identified 16 priority sports. Um, the government is intended to invest in and intended to improve. Uh, definitely number one, two, and three is, is football. But again, uh, the other uh, 15 sports is actually looking at in a, in a serious way in order to invest and to improve in the country. Yeah. So, and, and actually that's a very important factor, which is a very P European and, and uh, I would say Middle Eastern model of multi-sports clubs, run, right? But when we look at the trends in investments and we see multi-club ownership and creating those uh, virtuous cycles of generating value across the ecosystem, how can you leverage that from an investment perspective in terms of uh, having having the synergies that multi-sports give you, I, I could say, from the relevance of certain sports in certain areas around the planet, right? So, Sean, you, you actually, your group actually is very embedded into, into that reality, right? Yeah, with our equity owners, we have the San Francisco 49ers, who, with Jed York, owns Leeds United as well. Um, with the Harris Blitzer Sports Group, another one of our owners, they have the Philadelphia 76ers, the NBA team, the New Jersey Devils, the hockey team, and then of course, uh, also a piece of Crystal Palace. And then we have Arctos, which is a sports private equity fund that owns fractional ownership in about 20 different clubs around the world. Most recently, they just announced the partnership with PSG that you may have seen in the news. What I think is is what we believe in that is there are a lot of synergies that you can find. So, for example, if you're monitoring high performance, like the Philadelphia 76ers have a training facility in Camden where they're monitoring high performance, the latest technology, the latest ways to get the best other athletes to train the athletes mentally, physically, like that stuff is transferable regardless of what sport and what athlete you're in. There's things you learn about the customer um, in terms of how they, what, what's important to them, 
what promotions work. You can have cross promotions where if you're a fan of one club, then perhaps you will want to support someone else in the ownership group. Um, so I think there are a lot of synergies with multi-club ownership. I think the other side of it is also true, where you have to be very mindful. What works in the US for an NBA team does not work in the Premier League, and what works in the Premier League is not going to work at a, at a hockey team. Um, what we find is it's all about listening at, at the heart of it, so it's understanding what does each fan want, what does the customer want. So let's give an example. In Europe, in football, the fans don't like to be known as customers. They're actually like um, temporary custodians of what is a community asset in a football club, right? And that is very different than the American in the American mindset. Um, so I do think that there are a lot of things. And then, you know, there's some real challenges. What if you only have capital to invest in one of your clubs or stadiums? Where do you put it to? Where do you focus on? Um, you know, so I think there are a lot of things. There's a lot of pros and cons, but I do think if done right with the right lens, with the right understanding, with the right listening, and the right speaking to customers, you can leverage a lot of synergies, like similar to what we've seen with with our various shops there. Yeah, Tony, going f far from football, which is, is sailing, and but you you are part of a board uh, of a football club as well, and you are uh, involved in other investments. How do you how, how how do you see that opportunity in terms of diversifying across a, a different you know a different mix of portfolio portfolio that can generate value for a principal? Yeah, right. and then you know when you look from you know we yeah I'm the board of Cordoba uh, with um, a family office uh, from Bahrain, so we own Cordoba. We have a percent of Paris FC, Bahrain Victory Cycling Team, and we have a number of other sports like an Ironman event, etc. So the way we see it is you know. Um, there is also, I echo what Son saying in terms of the synergies, etc. but at the same time, it's a way to also to mitigate, mitigate risk. So in a way that you have some assets that you have, as Ben was saying before, the relegation risk that is quite influential on the value of the, of the assets that you're having, but then you have some other assets that are more global and you don't have this risk. So you are able to create a more steady growth of, of value. You know, we're saying like Formula One, global or Formula e, you have a number of set of teams or in the NBA or any other sports assets, you don't have this relegation risk. So you are, even though the asset might be a little bit more, um, you know, the, the, the entry price will be higher, you know, you are able to grow value without being able to mitigate that risk of relegation. So when you see from a, across a portfolio of different sports, different assets, different geographies, global, local, regional, you know, you have to take in consideration all those aspects to be able to create the value of the whole portfolio. So you can, you know, you can take some risk in some other, like for example in football, and you can be more aggressive, uh, and you know, hopefully you were able to get from a third division club to a first division club, and you get to European, and your value will increase exponentially, and you can have another approach more conservative with some other global sport that you can, like a Formula One team, like Artos and other investment they have done, or sell GP that you know we have now investors coming in. That is a close circus. So we are ten teams, twelve teams will be maximum, and that's it. You know, so we are going to grow as the league and the competition grows. So it's going to be a, a more long-term uh, investment for for that. Yeah, actually, Ben, you you alluded earlier to to something that that I you know also been uh, an expat in play, even though I've been here twenty years in, in Europe. I found fascinating, which is a, the the venue situation in Europe, which it, I would say is far from ideal uh, because of the age of some of those buildings that needed renovations uh, that are, you know, uh, impending. But the reality is that, as you mentioned, most of the venues are publicly owned. So for for any pro property, a club or any investor even, to look at how you can extract value, and definitely there's a market there that you know needs of new buildings for not only sports but multi events. Um, how 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 would you tackle, or what would be the ideal situation for you to tackle that? In is either trying to find some sort of partnership, long term uh, agreement, lease operation of those public uh, facilities, so you can actually have an investment plan and, and a commercial plan or it's totally going through the private you know, route and actually making that investment? 
Um, yeah, it's a, it's a hugely controversial topic, and again, one that has a lot of risk and also has a lot of emotion tied to it. Uh, the fans, who again, believe that they are the owners of this club, as, as Sean mentioned, and, and that we are merely the custodians, the people that kind of manage it for them, um, they're very attached to you know, their, their, their home and their historic facility. To move someone out of it, even if it's a crumbling mess, is very challenging. Um, and again, it's also very hard to replicate the emotion, the history, the the fervor associated with that building you take someone out of it and move them to a, a suburban stadium like maybe a Foxborough with a with a, um, you know with the Patriots and it loses a lot of that energy you lose the kind of pre-game environment the energy the uh, even the acoustics so that's that's really challenging and again I think on the stadium in investment front it's hugely risky for those of us that are lower you know kind of sitting at the second tier of the table if you're a, a PSG or a Man City or a United or whatever you know and and you really are seeing year after year appreciation, you can look at that major infrastructure project, I think, more confidently. Um, there's There's been a lot of kind of cautionary tales in our league, again, likes of uh, Levante, who spent a lot of money on a beautiful new stadium only to get relegated or are now in a precarious financial position where I think they were close to declaring bankruptcy at the beginning of this season. So very dangerous to do that. So where, where I think is a bit of a better um, kind of angle is to look at the infrastructure around academies and player training. One of the things I say as an American, again, in, in Europe, particularly in Spain, is that the quality of the infrastructure that we have in Spain in La Liga is below American high school standards in many instances. So, I mean, Real Madrid aside and a couple other teams, I mean, American high schools, let, don't mention American colleges who spend $200, $300 million on a locker room and game place and massage <laughs> um, facilities for their football or basketball teams. Um, so there's a huge upgrade to go. And I think global customers uh, and, and players know that Europe is where you know football is built today and that's democratizing. But today, I think we still have a bit of a monopoly on it. And so um, if we can build better facilities around academies, and youth training, we can build ancillary revenue streams that have a more predictable payback, regardless of whether we're in the first half of the table or out of the league altogether. Um, and and then and then finally, when we do look at stadiums, we have to look again at a, at a very robust place, not just to improve the game day experience. In our case, we have made an announcement about a new stadium project with the objective of it being something that can be used year-round for events and, and create a lot of, again, sustainable revenue outside of football because we just cannot bank on results. Yeah, I, and actually that's a good point that puts to manifest the role of you know uh, the, the, the public institutions in terms of actually how they see developments and how they see potential operations and actually attracting more events and not just football mm -hmm. every other week there. And I wanted to, to jump on that topic to, to Sean and Mr. Mokwell because when you are developing sports as, as, as you are doing here in Saudi, we tell me the facilities is, is, a, is a big part of that. So being able to have stadiums, especially if you are bidding for having a World Cup, inshallah. <laughs> so uh, I, I wanted to, to have your perspective in terms of how, from the public perspective, you are looking at uh, investments. And Sean, with your experience in terms of actually assessing how those projects need to come together, I think there's a, a good uh, conversation there. So Mr. Pogba. It's um, no secret to anyone that um, the current, there is a huge gap between the current status of our facilities and the ambition. It's, it's clear to everyone. Um, the point is now how to bridge this gap. Uh, bridging this gap with different type of facilities, stadiums, arenas, facil training facilities. Those will definitely create opportunities for private sector to be part of that ecosystem. Um, our plans is very clear. Um, our hosting plans are very clear. Um, where we're heading with the, leer, uh, with the league is very clear as well. So having the AFC 27 and hopefully, inshallah, the World Cup in 34, um, definitely uh, we would, that will need uh, to improve the facilities and the infrastructure in Saudi Arabia. And this is what our plan, um, definitely partnering with the private sector, including the investors locally and globally comes in and participates in our sector is our goal, then that is uh, how we do it. Um, uh, being part of that ecosystem at this stage is a great advantage for investors because 
there is a huge potential coming. We have seen what happened in the last few years, and we know what is coming in the future. So this is a great chance to jump in at this time in order to move, uh, I mean, to be with the wave that is coming in the sports sector. Sure. Yeah, and I, the, you know, for us with Elevate, we work with both of these situations where there's one situation where there is no chance for capital improvements because you don't own the stadium and you can't, or that there is a lot of excitement in the country, a lot of activities that would lead to long-term returns. But I, I, I think that like in that vein, there are things we can do t in the first case where you don't own the real estate. Like, let's take this conference room for a minute. Let's say World Football Summit's like, hey, we want to increase more revenue. Okay, what could you do? You could put a perhaps a velvet rope in the middle three rows and sell those tickets for more. And maybe the people who pay a little bit more get a one-to-one -one with the speaker. You could put some extra food and beverage in, in the back corner. Perhaps the people in the velvet rope have the opportunity to ask a question. And that's all things that you could do to increase revenue and the experience without touching anything in this ballroom that someone else owns. So we think that what we work with is, in that situation, we work with a lot about what can you do to program the fan experience differently and really listen and understand what they want to deliver them uh, value based on what you have and what cards are dealt. Because again, not every situation can you do that. On the other side of the, the coin, if you do have the opportunity, we do something called a, a feasibility study. And the two key things, of course, we look at competitive landscape, we look at current pricing, we analyze the millions of tickets that are being sold and in and around the market. But the other key thing that we look at are focus groups and surveys. So, so many people, and I've been guilty of this too, we think we understand our fan, but until you actually talk to them and listen, you don't really know what they want. So for us, that's a focus group. So that's putting 20 customers in a room and asking them questions about their experience. What would it be for them to buy more? What would it take for them to buy more? They want better parking. They want uh, more networking with others. Um, so we do a, a focus groups is, is one way. And then we also do customer surveys. Uh, we use a method called conjoint. So it's conjoint analysis. It's a, it's a survey methodology where we have people l uh, answer a list of 40 questions and we find out the customer's willingness to pay. And what we found when you do these studies with customers is a lot of times they will actually tell you what they're willing to pay and it's a lot more than you think. So we've had numerous examples with F1 properties, um, football clubs, big four sports in America, where we all thought, oh, you couldn't take prices up to a certain level, but we've learned from the customers when you actually ask them that if you provide an experience that's commensurate with what they want, the parking, food and beverage, the programming, the networking, all those things, they would actually pay more. So for us, there's a, we have a five-step process that we use to identify what is the improvements that you could make, capital or otherwise. And then from there, that's only when we suggest investing or doing something larger. But you know, you'd be surprised in, in how much you, you can glean from these studies if you listen and, and try it. Yeah. Actually, uh, to, to kind of sum up, uh, I want us to look a little bit into the future, not too, not too far away, but I uh, wanted to get your perspective on what are concrete trends that you are noticing in terms of investment in sports, especially in Europe and, and, and Saudi and, and the rest of the uh, Middle East, and, and if you see that there's a, a shift in terms of the understanding of what is at stake really in terms of investment. And I think we come from a boom of you know, a lot of you know, what they call dry powder that actually came into sports, but now it seems that there's more rationalization about that uh, investment. So uh, to start with, with Ben. It's a broad, broad question, but, but a good one. Um, we have, um, you know, it's evolving very rapidly. And again, because of the democratization of sport, because we have now uh, leagues across the world that are producing great talent, I think the, you know, the, the World Club Cup being here is great uh, show of, of the type of talent that we, um, we see across the world the ability to, to, to weave those clubs together through multi-club ownership um, and, uh, and just the overall amount of capital that this is now attracting. And I think I, we have obviously this region to thank for supercharging it recently, but that is creating now a multipolar universe. Uh, it was very Eurocentric and now um, this region will become very formidable. North America is becoming formidable in its own right um, and we'll have you know our own World Cup even, even more um, in, in the short term. And so I think that will draw even more 
more fans to this. The Messi effect in the United States has been tremendous. And so I think it will be about how do we channel that capital that's coming in in a sustainable way. I think there will be a lot of tears and a lot of value destruction if people aren't thoughtful about this because they don't recognize the risks that are associated with this. But hopefully it takes what is already the world's game and further institutionalizes it the way that we've seen a lot of other existing American sports be a bit more systematic and thoughtful. And we're seeing that, for instance, particularly on the data side of things. I mean, I think there was, you know, there was a history of doing things in American sports and, for instance, baseball, where there was a look and feel to what a player looked like. Uh, and we went off gut for years. And, and now with, you know, with Billy and, and others uh, um, kind of evolving that in, in baseball, it changed the way we saw the game. We're seeing that now in, in, in football in Europe. I mean, Billy is now doing an incredible job at AC Milan and other clubs that deploy those tactics, even in our league, again, from an American viewpoint are, are, are overturning the apple cart. And so I think now the integration of technology, <clears throat> which is evolving so rapidly and AI, not to use the buzzwords, but and integrating that into um, how we evaluate talent, because I always say, I'm so envious of my friends that own NFL teams because when they look at a talent pool, they're just looking at American college students in uh, just a couple kind of D, you know tiers of D1 football, and then they're looking at other NFL teams. We are evaluating millions of players from around the world from the second division in Japan and the Montenegrin League and the, the Salvadorian League. And I mean, we have to take all that data and then pray that, that they find chemistry on the pitch when they've never met each other. And, and again, a lot of that is down to just the eyesight of our, our, uh, our technical staff and, and coaches. If we can quantify that and, and make it more systematic and predictable, we can drive significantly out, out, out return results. So I'd say the two takeaways are capital flows and how that changes the landscape and, and technology. Sure. I think non-traditional is really interesting to look at. I mean, I learned a lot from Tony earlier today on just sale GP and the opportunities in, in that sport. Um, I think back to when, when we opened Levi's, we had one of the most sophisticated Wi-Fi and DAS systems, and the whole thought was, oh, great, great news. Let's get replays to everyone within five seconds of every play so you can sit in your seat and you can order food to your seat. And what we found now, which won't be a surprise to anyone, that what's really actually more important is the upload speeds because people want to be in there on TikTok and Instagram and Snapchat uploading their content saying, I'm at the football game. Um, and then, of course, with the aging baby boomer generation and the new millennials and Gen Z, um, thinking through, like, what is, where are the opportunities where you can get these leagues, teams, owner, ownership groups, where you can get this bite-sized content that will get to these new, new age of customers, what will resonate, what will resonate with brands as they're trying to reach the new age of customer. So I do think that thinking outside the box, thinking of new and non-traditional sports, um, that's really enticing. Also, the value you can get them at. In, in many ways, I mean, look in Europe, uh, outside of the Premier League, it looks like a lot of the European broadcasting uh, league deals are, are quite capped now. Like, it seems like we've, we've hit a bit of a plateau. You mentioned the stadiums. I think there are, I believe there's four uh, Serie A clubs that own their stadium and two League One clubs that own their stadium. Of course, in the Premier League, there's 16 of 20 that own their stadium. So if you're looking at a real estate play, that sometimes could be thwarted or... or or held down. So I do think that some of the, the lesser known sports, non-traditional areas of opportunity and places where you can tell a story to me is really important. Um, and then leverage that story. So everyone knows the Wrexham story now of a traditionally, you know, probably unremarkable club that has now became global news. And then they've taken that to ownership of Alpine F1 now. So they're using that to catapult their story, their content uh, elsewhere. So that's where I'd be looking um, in addition to the traditional, just big sports and, and sports like football. Looking at the Saudi market, um, maybe it's, it's a little bit different than uh, what I've seen in the Europe. Um, there are multiple areas that are growing in Saudi, especially one of the uh, most interesting area happening last year is the club's privatization. Previously, all clubs are owned by the government. Now we have started the privatizing of those clubs. We started the big four clubs moving to PIF, and then four other clubs in second and third league are moving to four different entities, and we're starting the privatization program. So basically, investing in clubs in Saudi is a new thing. It's, it's a new untapped area, and coming with the current status where we're heading, it's, 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 there is a huge potential. Investing in those clubs um, definitely will create many revenue streams 
um, like for example, investing in stadiums, broadcasting, sponsorship, naming rights, you name it, anything related to those clubs they can do. Um, even untapping new um, technology, for example, what we've seen at Tottenham and Juventus having their uh, documentaries on Amazon Prime, um, clubs could use those things. So many areas of investment could be happening related to the clubs. Other than clubs, we have other areas, of course, like the infrastructure, the facility that we have mentioned before. Um, so many investment can happen in the, in, the, in the sports sector in Saudi. Still, we are on stage. I don't want let me call it a startup phase, where there are so many opportunities, some of them even untapped. Um, so um, whatever area you focus on, you will find many opportunities that actually can take you, uh, can take you up. Absolutely. Tony? So I think, yeah, investors now are becoming more and more sophisticated. You know, they have more experience in to do this. And at the same time, you know, the way, the way you see at the fans and the way you see at the people they consume sports, um, you know, you are looking always for, um, for the content and the content is keen, football is keen, but at the same time is sports is the content that the people they want to see at life. So it's still, it still is a, it's a very important aspect why TV revenues or other uh, media revenues are growing so fast because it's the one that capture the people in front of the TV. We are competing sports with other, um, you know, other entertainment like the Netflix of the world or the Apple of the world. So that's why, you know, this is important why sports you know, still the prime content and why they're paying these revenues because at the end is the ones everyone is sitting down in front of the television or the phones, etc. It's true that sports is evolving quite a lot and the content, the people they consume that content is evolving very quickly. It's very difficult now with the new generations to sit down in front of a, of a television for 90 minutes. My daughter, you know, she's 12 years old, die hard from a, from a football club, but it still she doesn't stay like I'm staying 90 minutes watching the game. So I think all the sports are evolving to that, are evolving to see how they can attract this new generation to be able to consume that the sports. But at the same time, and I think it's football that has a big challenge, how we're going to be able to be more attractive and to be able to appeal this new, gen new generation. So that's a challenge for football. Other sports are evolving very quickly. Um, you know, we in I put it a little bit talking about cell GP. We change the whole sailing. You know, we do 15 minutes rates. It's adrenaline, pure adrenaline. The way you consume is people that they have no idea about sailing can understand it. So it's not the traditional sailing. But you can see in other sports, global sports that are involving, you know, Formula One, we try to survive the way they want to do content, the way the pre races, etc. So I think, you know, investors will always continue investing in sports. But at the same time, uh, the investment say, uh, properties and also the leagues and the sports will have to evolve in the next few years to be able to to attract those investments and to be able to you know to grow yeah absolutely well thank you very much for being here i think it was uh, wonderful we could spend hours speak <laughs> speaking about the the tribulations and the opportunities as well but i want to ask you for a round of applause for tony mazur sean and ben for being with us and being able to uh, share so much insight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.